Tom Kiddle, he's the director of Nile, is an ELT expert who's worked in Chile as a university director and um, academic research director, and is working from Norwich today, and is going to be talking about principle and practices in asynchronous online learning. So Tom, if you can hear me, can you please turn your camera and mic on again? Uh, we all know that you're you're very busy, so we really appreciate the fact, step by step, yeah, you're really busy, so we really appreciate the fact that uh, you're making the time to be with us. It's really great to see so many of you. So Tom is uh, turning his camera and mic on. As I said before, our servers and our click meeting servers are overloaded because a lot of people are, hi Tom, working from home. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay, Federica? Yes, I can hear you okay. I can see you. So I'm going to hand over and thank you again for being here. Okay, great. Thank you very much for um, inviting me to be here. Uh, good morning uh, from Norwich. Welcome to my home. Um, uh, you can see that it's uh, rather bright behind me. This is my youngest son's bedroom. Um, the quietest place in the house where the, while they're learning from home downstairs. Um, it's great to be here and uh, I'm really um, in, in awe of, of the way that everybody is pulling together and, and offering uh, all of this um, content to help each other in our uh, learning communities around the world. Uh, I shouldn't be looking at the public chat box, it's quite overwhelming to see um, how many different countries are represented in this webinar and I hope I can do it uh, justice in terms of sharing my experience and the experience of Nile of what uh, asynchronous online learning means and, and we're going to um, work uh, through um, some aspects of, uh, of live versus asynchronous uh, teaching online and then focus in on, on what we mean really when we're talking about asynchronous online teaching, um, looking at the platforms that are available, talking about the platforms that are available, the, the typical kinds of activity that, that are available in, in um, asynchronous virtual learning environments and then talking about what it means in terms of teacher competences, in terms of setting up courses um, and where, where the teaching exists because I think that um, what we're often facing is, is trying to put uh, the teaching into the asynchronous space. When we look at um, the differences between live and asynchronous uh, teaching, it's very easy to see the links between uh, the face-to-face -face classroom environment and a live online environment. In a live online environment, um, very similar to a face-to-face uh, -face classroom. All the students are in there at the same time. We have scheduled sessions. We have a timetable of um, when the class starts and when the class finishes and when the teacher walks in the door or turns on the web camera and appears in the, in the classroom. Um, we have in our online space, what's often called the host and participants, the, uh, the terminology rather than a teacher and students, because these are, are used um, in, um, in uh, multiple settings, not just educational settings. The platforms that we're using for live teaching can be, can be applied to, to all sorts of interactions. And we have a range of different platforms that give us that, that virtual space. You'll be familiar with um, new names that have entered our lexicon in, in the, the last few months, the, the Zoom platforms, the, the Click Meeting we're on today, the Adobe Connect platforms, the Blackboard Collaborate, the Google Meet, all of these different um, online spaces give us that sense of bringing people together and working at the same time in a, in a live online space, sometimes called synchronous teaching. I prefer to use the term live because I think it's easy to, to miss the, the, uh, the, uh, the prefix of A in asynchronous and, and to be confused about if we're talking about synchronous versus asynchronous. It's uh, probably one of the, the most uh, useless little prefixes in, in English, that little A for, for asynchronous. Um, we say, well, what, what is it that asynchronous um, really focuses on in terms of teaching and learning is, is our focus today. And so the differences that we want to draw from um, asynchronous against live are that in asynchronous teaching, largely the content is accessed and the activities are accessed and completed and participated in at a time of students' own choosing. 
we can have that in lockstep and we can say, okay, we want this all to be done today or we want this all to be done in the next two hours or we want this to be done during this week. But largely the decisions about when to access the asynchronous content and the asynchronous activities are at this time of the students choosing, a time hopefully of students' convenience. But we still have the possibility to do collaborative activities, collaborative between students as peers and between teacher and students uh, in a, in a uh, traditional educational relationship. And we have the capacity for students to do individual activities. I think there's a, a sense of an old style of asynchronous uh, teaching that it essentially means interaction between preloaded content and individual access. But we want to emphasize the fact today that there's a lot more collaborative activities that are possible within the virtual learning environments, within the platforms that are available for asynchronous uh, teaching and learning today that should be taken advantage of. And I want to try and draw the parallels um, between what we might do as a teacher in the face-to-face -face classroom and what we can do asynchronously online, because it's very, um, very challenging sometimes to see, well, where's the teaching? I can see where the teaching happens if I'm teaching live in a classroom, but I can't see where the teaching happens when I'm working asynchronously. I can see that there's content there and I can see the students access the content, but apart from providing the content, where does my role exist as a, as a teacher? Where do I get my teaching moments? Where do I, am I able to, to bring my expertise to the students rather than just presenting them with content and allowing them to access it. So we're going to talk a bit about um, the, the importance of personalised and group and individual feedback as a, as a tutor competence in asynchronous spaces and um, also what we can do with feedback that's, um, that's generated in an automated space because um, uh, uh, the, the, the answers are pre-programmed, but the teacher can, can access the results of a group of students or, or, or a class or, or individuals within that. Some examples of, um, of asynchronous platforms that we're going to be referring to today, um, you may be familiar with, with some of these. Um, Moodle platform is the one we use at Nile. It's the kind of the place that hosts our course. Blackboard is another very common university virtual learning environment. The one that we um, uh, showcase and train on in our new um, free Take Your Teaching Online course is, is Edmodo, as it's a, a free virtual learning environment that anybody can set up to, to run classes and run courses from. And I'll be talking about a couple more as we go through. But um, we can see the different uh, platforms there compared to the live platforms in the sense of um, where are we going to host the content and the activities and the asynchronous work that we need to. So let's move into um, our first aspect of asynchronous online teaching, which really asks the question, within these platforms, what are the, the typical activities that are available to me? Now, I saw a... Um, I saw a, an article yesterday, uh, a LinkedIn article, and it was talked about the differences between uh, live and asynchronous teaching, saying live teaching was all about the, the interaction and students being able to communicate with each other, whereas asynchronous teaching was about reading PDFs and uh, contributing to discussion forums and doing tasks by email. And it just seemed such a, a, a disappointing summary of the potential of asynchronous online teaching that, that we'd be constrained to kind of the essentially setting a homework task that is read this and write about it and, and there's so much more that we can have in our asynchronous online environment that I think we need to kind of embrace that as part of our asynchronous uh, online potential rather than just saying well it's about uploading a document and asking students to, to discuss that document. So obviously, some of the things that we can do in terms of uh, asynchronous learning are providing content for, for learners to, to work with. And that content could be text-based, it could be something that we've written, it could be um, something that we've brought in there, it could be uh, something that we've, we've copied and pasted from another source, it could be referring students outside the platform to, to look at a course book that they've already got in front of them, that, that they've got physically outside the computer space, it could be something that we've generated in terms of a handout we might have used in class, and um, it, it, or, or something that we've, um, we've uh, 
pulled together from, from authentic material that we found elsewhere on the internet. But it doesn't just have to be text-based. It could be video-based, and those videos could be something, again, that the teacher has generated. Um, we'll talk a little bit about screencasting in a moment as, as, as asynchronous content preparation. But it could be video that's sourced from any one of the, the video streaming platforms or any one of those platforms which curate interesting content from video for, for teaching. You may be familiar with um, Jamie Keddy's work in kind of uh, lesson stream and, and bringing video content alive particularly with a language learning focus. So it may be content that's brought in on video from somewhere else uh, that's designed for language teaching or content that's designed for general viewing, but that can be purposed for a task that we have. Similarly, we can bring in audio content. There's no reason why we couldn't do simple voice recordings using our own microphones, or we can bring in MP3 files uh, that we've found either uh, freely available on the internet or that belong to course resources that we have uh, in, in, our, in our course materials. So um, rather, than, rather than thinking that the only way we can do listening activities is through the live sessions, it's, it's also possible, of course, to bring in the audio content as part of the content that we expect learners to engage with in an asynchronous space. And potentially, much more valuable, because one of the things I'm going to keep coming back to is that um, the value of asynchronous online learning does lie in the self-paced element, the fact that you can return to content, you can, you can access content at the time of your choosing and as many times as you choose to give yourself that time, that thinking time, that processing time that's very over, often missing in either a live online session or a face-to-face -face session. So emphasizing the deeper thinking, the deeper processing time, the access to, to doing things at your own pace engaging with content at the time that's right for you and for the length of time that's right for you is one of the real advantages of asynchronous online learning. So one of the aspects, of course, is about the content, and we'll talk more about the types of content in a moment. But of course, it's not just the content, it's, it's what we do with the content, it's the activities that sit around those uh, that content. And I've broken this down to some of the kind of the typical activity types that we might find in a, in a virtual learning environment. One side is based around focused, task-driven um, student activities and student responses, moving from quizzes at one end, which generally have a, a pre-prepared, pre-programmed, automated feedback answer, so they're based around multiple choice questions or short answer questions, where we can program the, the, um, the, the virtual learning environment to tell the students the right answer afterwards. Or the kind of activities that you might find available on a, a, a content-rich platform like Macmillan English Campus, where you have these activities which, which generate a correct answer, generate a score and a grade book, generate the, uh, the, the automated results in more of a, um, a selected response or a short answer response format. So we've got that kind of one end of the spectrum of, of student task-focused uh, interaction. In the middle, I think we've got these things which are more questionnaire based. If you use Moodle, you'll know there's a questionnaire function and that kind of generates qualitative content, but on a, uh, a single sentence, single phrase level very often that we get students to respond with opinions or giving examples of, of, of their language rather than uh, writing constructed uh, responses, longer text, and rather than selecting the right answer, questionnaires encourage that kind of personalization of content and a short form responses that can be compiled and collated and curated and fed back on by a teacher. And we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we've got this thing that I've called assignments, which is perhaps to um, to testing related a word, it doesn't have to be graded assignments with marking criteria, but assignments essentially mean what can we get the students to produce in terms of their um, in terms of their own created content rather than uh, rather than responding to, to answers that we've given them, how can they create their own contents? Um, so that may be verbal content, it may be oral based uh, assignments, uh, recording their response, video-based recording with uh, recording over presentations or text-based responding to, to a task that's a, a writing task. And all of these will require some kind of feedback to give it value. And that feedback could well come from the teacher, but it could be peer feedback as well as we'll come on to in a moment. So we've got these, these kind of task-focused activities that we can set the students a task and say, I want you to respond in this way. One end of the spectrum, the quiz where they're gonna get an instant answer to 
the other end of the spectrum, the assignments where the, the responsibility for feedback sits elsewhere. And then we've got those kind of uh, threaded discussions. You'll be very familiar with this from, from all sorts of different platforms, but a very common uh, feature of, of asynchronous online learning is the kind of forum-based approach, a, a starting post, an initial post, and then responses to that post from, from uh, peers, from colleagues, and from um, the uh, and from the teacher, the uh, the expert in that in that space as well. Forums tend to make us think of uh, written responses, but it doesn't have to be um, it doesn't have to be just text followed by text. A lot of platforms will will offer um, opportunities to to have threaded voice discussions. Um, uh, and uh, some of the tools that we use at Nile are very much focused on this multimodality of response in a discussion. So you can either choose to respond with text or you can choose to respond with your microphone or you can choose to respond with your webcam, giving that kind of uh, sense of choice for students. So um, forums can, yes, they can be text-based, but they can also be multimodal in nature. There's a lovely tool. One of the tools that we feature in our um, new free online course uh, is called uh, Flipgrid and Flipgrid is based around staggered discussions, responses through short um, uploaded video content from, from students. So the teacher starts a discussion, often starts the discussion with their own video, and then students respond, continue that discussion, continue the theme um, with their own video based responses. So this, this tool um, gives us the option for the same kind of staggered discussion as the forum, we need to move away from thinking of forums as just text-based uh, interactions. Obviously, the asynchronous nature of this means that those discussions take place over time, and there's a there's a teaching competence uh, attached to that. So how can the teacher hold engagement? How can the teacher direct the flow of the discussion? How can the teacher make sure that there's rich content and support going in there? And that's a um, that's a, a, another teacher competence that we'll come on to talk about in a moment. Another form of collaboration is that kind of uh, co-constructed space, tools which encourage students, participants to work together to create a, a piece of content. That may be content that's, that's idea based. It may be just a kind of a space to share ideas and collate ideas and to rearrange, organize ideas. Or it may be a quite, quite uh, a good deal more rich. It may be a collaborative writing activity, a wiki-based activity where multiple people are contributing to the same document, uh, whether that's creating a narrative or creating a, a, a brochure or creating some other project-based activity. Um, that idea of having asynchronous collaboration, the project-focused development between the students with the teacher commenting, supporting and feeding back is also something that works very well asynchronously because it allows that uh, external resource use, it allows that pacing that couldn't happen uh, effectively within the confines of a, a, a live or face-to-face -face lesson and it allows that shared space where we can see attributions of who's contributed what to the, to the final product or to the outcome. And it's also very easy to share online uh, within the environment for other people to comment and give peer feedback and uh, and uh, praise and support and all of those kind of peer assessment uh, principles that we'd want to hold dear. So there's the wiki side where we're creating a project, but there are also those kind of uh, just throw out ideas, the walls, the whiteboards. You're probably uh, very familiar with a tool which is shown in the image here, Padlet, where where people can contribute all bits of different content, media rich content, image based content, text based content, video based content, um, annotation content, creating a, a collaborative space. And that can be driven by a task from the teacher or it can be just opened up for, for students to, to personalize a, a particular topic in a way they're, they're interested in. That can be centrally created or uh, it can be something that's individually created and then shared as, as individual spaces um, for, for uh, comparison and uh, feedback at, at a later stage. And then we have a whole lo load of tools that we might, might just refer to as, as web whiteboards. In fact, web whiteboard is one of the easiest to use. If, if you want a space where anybody who has the link can contribute something in, in very short form, um, can can write, can uh, annotate, can draw, can can uh, 
comment through emojis on a, in a, in a shared collaborative space, very easy to find access to a, a web whiteboard that can be that space that can be con contributed to over time and build up a, a, a rich um, a rich content uh, space that we can feed back on. Other content that can be can be used is, is having downloads in there. So when we want students to be studying something for um, uh, offline, perhaps, or or to, to read in more depth or to listen to in more depth, we can add content that can be downloaded. And also, of course, the virtual learning environment can be a space where we we offer links to other third party activities or to, to third party content or to, to applications, to resources, to dictionary resources, to, um, to corpus resources, to, to particular tools that uh, um, uh, the students will, will bring in to this space. And again, this is one of the advantages of content in the asynchronous space that we have that time for students to go off and come back to um, to come back to the, the shared central space in order to um, to bring this together. I, I talk in, in some of my webinars about live online teaching, how dangerous it is to send students outside the classroom space while you're running the session because it's difficult to get them back in there. Um, but I don't think that rule applies for, for asynchronous teaching. It's one of the great advantages to be able to send students off to other resources think about them, process them, use those resources and bring that knowledge, bring that learning back into the shared asynchronous space. So I'm trying to make the point that we've got a lot of variety, we've got a lot of variety in terms of content and, and activity types, rather than just thinking asynchronous online learning means putting up some content and setting up a discussion or giving a, a think about task. And I want to move on to think about, well, where does that content come from? Um, I think it's useful to think about what, what are we talking about uh, in terms of content. So we again, we get that sense of variety, that sense that content in an asynchronous space doesn't have to be single channel, doesn't have to be just um, uh, doesn't have to be just a content uh, um, that that's comes from a single source. That the richness in an asynchronous space, just as the richness in a face-to-face -face classroom, comes from bringing content and personalising the content, and also having pre-prepared content which is professionally produced. So I like to think of content in, in three, um, three areas, content which is generated by the teacher. So this is content which you've decided is appropriate for your own context, for the level of your students, for the interests of your students. And one of the most uh, rich tools for uh, screencasting is, uh, sorry, for, for generating teachers' content is screencasting. Now, my colleague Russell Stannard does a lot of work on screencasting. You'll be able to see his videos on, on how to use free screencasting tools on his channel of uh, teacher training videos. Um, but essentially, screencasting is a way of putting your content into a video that you can then embed into a virtual learning environment. And that may just be welcome videos. That may just be something that introduces students to the task. Um, and in, uh, in terms of um, generating the, um, uh, the content for a lesson, it may be that you, you're doing a, a mini presentation or, or you're talking about the particular topic area to give students a, a, an insight into that content, making your own, um, making your own screencast there. We've already talked about the richness of teachers being able to generate and bring in video content that's appropriate, bring in their own text, whether that's authentic text or graded text from, from course specific materials and bring in audio files as well, audio files that they've made, audio files that um, have come with a course book or particular resource. And also teacher generated content in terms of when in a face to face classroom, we might be preparing a handout. It's similarly, um, really rich content for teachers to generate that as, as documents, handouts that can be downloaded, worked on, resubmitted. It doesn't have to be that every activity takes place within the virtual learning environment. So there's content that's brought in by the teacher, but crucially, I think in the asynchronous space, even more so than in the live space, there's student generated content. There's content which can be brought in by the students' contributions in terms of responses to activities that we've set, in terms of using their presentations, their assignments as rich content to be learning content for others, to be uh, used as the springboard for further exploration, for, for extension of the language focus or the, the, the topic focus, and for students to bring in their own attachments, to bring in their own um, 
their own personalized uh, part of the learning. That may be their favorite songs. It may be something that they've produced, a kind of a book review that they've produced. It may be images that they have taken from their local environment um, that, that add this richness to the course. So using the um, using the students as generating the content just as we do in a in a personalized approach to, to community of language teaching I think student generated content is really a, a rich resource asynchronously it's quite hard to do that live because we don't have the preparation time and, and students can potentially be uh, be quite silent in terms of exposing themselves uh, their, with their language proficiency in a live space, but the advantage of the asynchronous world is that they have time to check, they have time to proof their own language, they have time to be comfortable with what they upload and what they share before they do it. Um, and then, of course, we have that whole richness of the uh, the third party generated content. We've got platforms which are, are full of uh, content in terms of presentations and practice activities and texts like Macmillan English Campus, where we, we get this professionally produced graded language content. You've probably, uh, if you have moved very recently into teaching online, you've probably still got students with physical course books that, that give us this content, that give us this uh, possibility of sending students outside the virtual learning environment to do readings in a physical course book. And then you've got all of that richness that's that's the internet in terms of um, where they can um, access uh, information about language, where they can access uh, language examples, where they can access video content on language, and where you can send them with, with links to other practice activities that are uh, freely available online. So we've got a, a huge range of different content types, and I think that some of the, the um, the benefits of asynchronous teaching are that we can bring in this variety that uh, a particular course doesn't have to focus on it's the teacher doing a presentation and the students responding to it or it's about doing these set of uh, formulated exercises and then the teacher giving the marks that the richness in the teaching can come from the variety in the content that we bring in. I'm seeing some, some comments there to, to slow down. Absolutely fine. I'm going to slow my speech down for you here. Um, I'm trying to to emphasise that the the variety available to the teacher, to the person programming a course, is to upload a range of different types of content and to use different sources for that content in order to to create the richness of the the uh, the online space and that we shouldn't think of uh, formulaic approaches to content that every unit every activity is the same but that we should try to encourage that there's peer student generated content to um, to support things that the teachers can produce and can bring in from elsewhere I want to move on to talk about teacher competences um, because I think one of the key things about asynchronous online teaching is what do I need to do in terms of managing the interaction of the participants in my course? Now, of course, we have our classroom management skills in terms of face-to-face um, -face classrooms, and we're developing those skills sometimes with a, a huge challenge in live online spaces. But managing interaction in an asynchronous uh, space is much more complex because we don't have that immediacy of uh, corrective feedback, corrective uh, management to bring people back to the same space. Uh, excuse me. So some of the things I want to emphasize that become part of teachers' competences in, in asynchronous teaching are thinking about how you're creating that rapport. Now we know that rapport within a face-to-face -face space is very important in terms of uh, creating learners' identities and allowing them to feel some uh, presence in the classroom and some ownership of the classroom space. But um, socialization in online asynchronous teaching is also very important. So if your class has suddenly moved online from being a face-to-face -face class, you may be less concerned with the kind of getting to know you activities um, and, and building class uh, cohesion. 
Um, but if you're starting a course online, it's really important to have that space to have um, socialization activities that are about introducing yourself to establish your online identity, to establish how much of your online identity you're prepared to share. So in some contexts that may be very open and it may be webcam based and presenting yourself. In other contexts, it may be that you choose an image as your avatar, not even a, a picture of yourself. And uh, you, you want to kind of preserve some of your uh, individual identity rather than sharing it, um, sharing your picture, sharing any personal information online. Of course, we have to consider um, the the, uh, the sharing of personal data and allowing the online space to be a, a safe space for everybody. But socialization within that is still possible. And that may be a kind of more traditional introduce yourself via this forum, but it could also be a, um, a peer discussion activity where you, you interact uh, asynchronously with a, a, a fellow student in the class and then introduce them in some way. It may be that you're talking about something that um, uh, you find differences and similarities between yourself and other students in the class through a, a discussion activity or a collaborative space like a, a whiteboard or a, 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 a wall. Um, but encouraging that socialization that so that we feel we're talking to and working with real people on the other side of computer screens it is crucial in, in managing and setting up that interaction. The second point is the crucial um, difference uh, between what we do with content in face-to-face -face and live teaching and what we do with content in asynchronous teaching. It's very tempting and I see a lot of examples of um, the idea that uploading content is the content is the task in itself. It's not the case. We need to be clear that whenever we add some content, whether that's text, whether that's audio, whether that's um, uh, video, that the task is central to how the students will interact with that content. It's not appropriate for online learning just to put things up and say, read this or watch this video. There's got to be a, a clear task. There's got to be a way of interacting with that that actually makes the task the focus of the activity and makes the, the uh, parameters of the task ones the students know what they're doing. So what do you want them to, to do in terms of how they're thinking about how they're processing the content? Are they reading it for, for personal effective engagement? Are they reading it to pull out bits of language that they're interested in? Are they reading it with a, a comprehension task that goes with it? Are they reading it with a productive task that comes on the end of it? How long do you want them to spend on that task and, and where do you want them to respond to that? And do you want that response response to be for the teacher's eyes? Do you want that response to be for their own um, vocabulary development? Do you want that to be for peer sharing? So you need to be quite specific in terms of the task that accompanies the content because that's the, the, the hook that you haven't got the opportunity to go back in as you would in a classroom and monitor and check that they're on task. We need to uh, we need to give them this uh, these parameters, these kind of guidelines in terms of content belongs with tasks. Even if those tasks are, I want you to think about this and pull out three bits of language that are useful to you, or take away two phrases, uh, two words that you didn't know before and share them in this space. I really feel that in terms of engaging with content, that you have to have um, some response built into the content in an asynchronous space. I completely agree uh, one comment there that it's it's the same in face-to-face -face teaching, but in face-to-face -face teaching, you often have the opportunity to see where, th where that's breaking down and where you might need to, to input um, or to reiterate the task or to, to reinforce the task in asynchronous spaces. Once you've lost that engagement with the content, it's very hard to get it back. Um, I think in terms of interaction, we need to increase variety. We need to uh, think that uh, although it's tempting to set up a structure where every unit follows the same stage, we have a, um, a piece of content to watch or listen to, we have a comprehension task, we have a discussion forum, and that's our model, and that's how we'll progress through every topic unit or every um, structural point in the, in the language syllabus. It does get very... Um, it does get very repetitive in an asynchronous online space. 
in a face-to-face -face classroom or a live classroom, the teacher can add the, the, the dynamism to that, can add the creativity to that that stops it being um, uh, repetitive. But when it's presented in an online asynchronous environment, I think that that working through and knowing exactly what's going to come next can be uh, can add to the kind of, this is a task uh, that I'm, I'm forced to do rather than something I'm engaging with. So um, increasing the, the variety and the different tasks you offer the students, but also the order in which you do them and the types of responses you expect are really important in asynchronous teaching. I also think it's crucial to make sure that your tasks have depth, that the depth comes from taking advantage of the increased processing time, the increased thinking time that the asynchronous space allows. So getting students to go off and, and rather than send, putting in an instantaneous response, seeing a task and giving a, uh, a response, um, that actually they are using other resources, they're using their, um, their, their online dictionary, they're using their, uh, a corpus uh, tool, they're researching the language, they're proofreading their own um, responses, and they're extending their responses um, beyond what we maybe have time for in a face-to-face -face classroom. And that depth is where we can really see the, the value of the asynchronous space. I think it's important to encourage where possible those constructed responses to take advantage of that idea that students have time to write and time to plan and time to edit and time to proofread. So we encourage them to, to construct, generate their own language that's the source of feedback or, or collaboration or, or interaction with peers rather than selecting responses and feeling that asynchronous interaction means here's the content, here's the multiple choice questions, job done. Uh, I think another point to make there in terms of that content, I think it's nice to send people to, to uh, external links. If you've checked those external links and you're sure that access is easy and that the content can be retrieved in a way that they want, or you open that to learner autonomy. But I think it is, um, it can get uh, very diverse if we send them off to other platforms, which also require logins and signups and, and generating accounts uh, and may, head them off into, into worlds where um, the content may be uh, inappropriate for them to, to use or to be exposed to. So I think very be very careful if you're directing them to use certain resources, check out those resources carefully and make sure they do the job that, that you're asking them to do, or ask learners to use their own resources and feedback on ones which worked effectively for them. And finally, instead of, um, uh, sorry, constructive responses is when students generate a, a piece of text from the, themselves rather than select a response in a multiple choice space or write a, a single sentence in response to a, a closed question. Constructive response means generating the language content yourself. Um, and of course, that, that final thing about copyright restrictions in terms of what you can embed in your own online platform, um, not everything is... Uh, copyright free and um, for some, in some contexts scanning a course book and putting it up there would not be uh, copyright uh, uh, acceptable. So do think about what you can um, put this. Okay. I'm going to go with one more um, uh, set of uh, ideas, things that I think are crucial here, and then talk a, 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 bit, a little bit more about some other resources. I think another teacher competence that we really have to, to encourage is the idea of, of what feedback we can, um, we can manage in an online uh, asynchronous space. Where does the teaching come in? And, and really, this is where, for me, the, the skill as a teacher is still upheld in an asynchronous space, that um, the feedback that the teacher can give to either the individual or to the to the group is really where the teaching comes in. Now, I'm not going to claim or, or be flippant about the idea that this suddenly reduces the teacher's workload. Potentially, having constructed responses and promising individual formative feedback on each response is a huge imposition on, on teachers' time, particularly when putting new content up, preparing new activities, thinking about the next set of uh, tasks is a is a day-to-day -day process. So manage your own time in terms of the tasks you, you set. Is it that you're going to give individual feedback or are you going to pull out some of the key points from 
everybody's um, responses and uh, give a summary of those and manage the students' expectations in terms of what they can get. Yes, they've written 150 words uh, as a post, but are you going to be able to respond to, to 20 times 150 words in the way you'd want to? On occasion, yes, absolutely, but um, uh, maybe you want to do group feedback or encourage uh, peer feedback in that space to to uh, to add the variety and to avoid overloading yourself with with um, marking responses and re responding online. Do look for those opportunities when you've got people doing similar or the same task. Look for those opportunities to pull out what are the common threads, the common themes, the common needs in terms of students, and don't feel guilty about giving group feedback that's supportive and formative to all in an asynchronous space, particularly as that then becomes a referable reference resource for others to go back in and look at again. Um, don't feel that uh, every individual has to get a personalized response if we're doing constructed response activities. And consider whether peer response, whether reading each other's answers, building on each other's um, uh, positive feedback is an acceptable way to, to manage that, to reduce the load on yourself. Can we get that first phase feedback, that positive encouragement, that I really like this that you did coming from peers rather than it all being dependent on the teacher to give feedback? When the teacher is taking on the role of, of giving feedback and giving supportive feedback, then it's crucial to value the students' contributions within the group, making sure that students are recognised when they can see each other's answers and when the teacher's feeding back to a whole group, that students are named and uh, get that attention for the quality that they've produced in there. What we refer to at Nile is the, the concept of weaving and waving. So weaving means trying through a discussion, through a collaborative space to weave students' contributions together to say this sounds very similar to a point that this person was making or there's a lot of similarities between this answer and this answer. Or waving, and waving means highlighting great uses of language, great examples uh, of, of uh, something that's been produced by students. So saying, I really liked what so-and-so did in this activity, or there's a great point made uh, in so-and-so's post on this content, or the, the response to this questionnaire was really interesting from this person. So, so valuing those individual students, making them sure that their, their content is being noticed and seen by the teacher and highlighted by the teacher to others is, is critical. And related to that is this idea of how teachers manage the feedback from start to finish of an activity done asynchronously. The idea of seeding, feeding and harvesting, the seeding is the, the planting the seed, the setting of the content, the engaging them with the, with the task, the, the setting of the, the controversial statement or the, 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 um, the, the image that's going to get them fired up. And then as the conversation begins, as the asynchronous contributions come in, feeding in more ideas, feeding in potential resource links, feeding in language uh, contributions to, to support that output, feeding in uh, perhaps corrective feedback during the discussion. And then at the end of um, the, uh, the, the activity, whether that's the end of the week or the end of the day or the end of a particular unit, the teacher having the skills to harvest the good points, harvest the things that we want to be positive about, to, to bring those things together and really highlight the, the strengths that the students have produced, giving that praise, but without um, necessarily feeling that we have to do individual um, contributions in terms of feedback. So those two sets of teacher competencies in the asynchronous space, I think are crucial. Being able to weave contributions together to make it a cohesive whole and wave at positive ideas. And also to set up a task, feed in the uh, the other resources and the, the, the teaching moments that are appropriate and harvest things at the end to round it off. Crucial. Part of the feeding is giving further development giving further resources, giving extension activities, making that formative, but also with spaces, and encouraging that that, uh, that can be highlighted um, at, at the end and, and also kind of seen as a springboard for students to go off and research something further or to have further practice somewhere else. And finally, in terms of that feedback, I think it's really crucial, just as we would in a face-to-face -face, uh, context, to think about that constructive 
comments and positive feedback the encouragement that you get in an online space is really valuable. We've, we've worked with this for, for five years in asynchronous online teaching at Nile and um, really that, that positive encouragement to encourage people to, to feel confidence in sharing their ideas that are, are far more permanent than if they were in a face-to-face -face classroom, that stay there, that can be revisited, that are open and accessible to other students in the class to, to pick through their, their language uh, for, uh, in a far greater depth than the ephemerality of the face-to-face the, the -face or the live environment. We really need to support that and encourage people, particularly in the first weeks, the first moments of a course, that their contributions are valued and their contributions are, are rich and their contributions are what are contributing to the course. So these are these are the crucial things I think in terms of deciding what content to add, in terms of managing interaction in an asynchronous space, and in terms of being in control and managing expectations and the, the skills that are involved in giving effective feedback. There's lots more that we can offer. I, I mentioned earlier a free online course. We've been working really hard over the last three weeks to put together this uh, online course, which covers aspects of uh, platform development, content generation, activity creation, teaching live lessons, further resources, um, and uh, all written by Nile experts in collaboration with Russell Stanard teacher training videos. You can get that from the Nile website now and, and enroll for free. Um, there's also a membership area that you can sign up for on the Nile website. Loads of different teaching activities in that uh, in that space, which can be easily adapted to both live and asynchronous online teaching. Great ideas for how you can get students collaborating. And then uh, Nile online courses, which take your teaching competences to new levels, are also available uh, through our website. So I hope that's, um, that that's a useful resource for you to, to, to work with and work on uh, in, in the coming weeks and coming months. A couple of links there um, to our website and uh, to me personally, if you want to, to, to ask any questions related um, to the content I've talked about here. Uh, I'm very grateful to McMillan for the opportunity to, to speak to you. Um, I know that this has been uh, a challenging uh, set of circumstances that continues and it's going to get uh, better for us all soon, but, but more challenging for some of us in the immediate future. And I hope that the support that McMillan is, is giving to you is, is valuable for that in your, in your daily lives. Good luck, everyone, uh, and let's stay together at this difficult time.